All right, we got tons of crazy passages today, including Jesus telling people to cut off their foot and their hand and gouge their eye out. And we got to ask the question, did he really mean it? Hey everybody, welcome to Bible Time. Craig here. Thanks for joining me today. We're going to jump right into God's Word. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 33. Wait, no, we're starting in verse 30. I remember that. Starting in verse 30, Jesus again foretells his death, come a resurrection. Hey, this is a place where we read the Bible together, and the primary goal is that you would grow in your relationship with Jesus. True affection, true love, true discipline, true obedience, that your heart would be inflamed with passion for the God of the universe. So I believe that that can partially happen through spending time knowing his heart through his word and listening to the Holy Spirit in prayer. So I'm not here to teach you. I'm just here to show you um, how I read the Bible and I hope that it helps you. So let's jump right in. Mark 9 verse 30. They went from there and passed through Galilee and he did not want anyone to know for he was teaching his disciples saying to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. This is now again, the second time that he's told them specifically that he's going to be killed. And when he is killed after three days, he will, ri he will rise. And they did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask him. So not only did he tell them that he's going to be killed, but that also he would rise from the dead. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. If you're new to the Bible, the term the son of man is a little different. And, uh, you know, speaking of the third person is a little different in general, but Jesus did that quite often. He referred to himself in the third person uh, quite, quite a few times in the Gospels. And oftentimes it was with some title. And this title in particular dates all the way back to the book of Daniel. And so the title is really a prophetic title that was representative of the Messiah. And so when he's referring to himself in that way, which is kind of weird for us, but nevertheless, it was his way of... of rooting his identity in that prophetic message from back then. So I just wanted you to know when you read that, if you're like new to the Bible, you're like, what's the son of man? What does that even mean? Uh, that's basically what that means. So, and they came to Carpenon and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and he called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. This is one of the radical things that Jesus said that maybe a lot of us take for granted because we just have heard it before. But like... This is counterintuitive to the entire way that the world works, generally speaking, and operates, pursue, what, what the world pursues. You know, Jesus' opinion is if you want to be great, you basically need to serve everybody. And this is the heart posture of who God is and what he's inviting us into. And then he illustrates it this way. He took a child and put it in their midst, in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Talk about applicable. We're all the time pretty much arguing, whether with our words or whatever, who is the greatest, comparing, usually using, you know, social media, pecking order at work. Um, it just seems like culture is all the time asking this question, who is the greatest? And Jesus's answer to that is that we would be last and servant of all. 
So I just wonder as a Jesus follower, like, do you really believe that? Do you really pursue that? Is that, is that what you desire or even anywhere close to what you desire? And the same for me. I got to ask those questions too. John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Always the name of Jesus. So here they try and stop somebody. Why? Because he was not with them. And then Jesus says, do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. Okay. For truly, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So let's remember, oops, let's remember this. Whoever's not against us is for us. Whoever causes one of these little ones to sin who believes in me, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands and go to hell. <laughs> Talk about radical things that he said. How about this one? To the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than be with two feet and thrown into hell. Again, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into hell. Two descriptors, unquenchable fire and where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. <sighs> wow. And then there's this weird line, for everyone will be salted with fire. And then the connotation between this form, you know, how, how it shows up in this gospel, this, this term here, salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how will it be made salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. That's a pretty different reference to this thought of salt and saltiness and salt being good than the Matthew account. But you'd have to go back and read that in probably Matthew 5. So, yeah. You want to look for application. Here's some application. <laughs> and I struggle with it because it's like, so many people along the way have just been like, well, obviously he didn't really, I mean, he didn't really mean that. You know, like, not really, but maybe he did. <laughs> maybe like, if you're gonna sin, you should literally do that. I oh, don't know. I just think it's like so easy for us to be like, well, that's ridiculous. Like, but man, what if, what if he's serious? I think it's at least worth considering, don't you? I mean, like the point is, no matter how hard something is to hear, if you really trust the source and you trust that that source is the God of the universe, don't you think you would be inclined to at least consider if what you're hearing is like literal or not? And so 
I think we should consider it and we should actually want to consider it. Now, that being said, my, my tendency right now at this moment is to believe that there are, are probably certain times when he genuinely would rather have us do this. I mean, I just, I just think that this is what it says. And of all else that I know of God, as he's revealed himself in the scriptures, I just believe that there would potentially be times that he genuinely would want you to do this because he cares that much about you, cares that much about us, that he doesn't want us to continue to walk in sin and separation from, from him. That being said, no, I do not think that this is what he always wants and that if you make one mistake, like chop off your hand. I do agree that in many ways, he's using, I don't know what the term is. Uh, he's exaggerating something to make a point. But I think his point stands and it is still pretty firm. And that is that if you're giving yourself over to sin, you need to do everything that you can to get free from that. And like, even if it costs you friendships, costs you a job, costs you money, costs you your hand, that it's more worth being right and restored with God and walking in integrity than it is to have any possession, including parts of your own body. So, you know what? You might not be cutting off anything and I don't want you to, I don't want you to have to, but I just want to invite you to consider, is there anything that you're giving yourself over to in this world that you shouldn't be and have you taken any measure to walk away from that for the sake of pursuing christ i think it's worth it so thank you for considering that thank you for joining me today some crazy uh crazy passages from jesus's mouth and uh yeah we'll we'll pick up again tomorrow well looks like we're talking about divorce so we'll pick up again there in Mark 10 tomorrow. I'll see you then.